Welcome to Home Gym History, brought to you by Garage Gym Radio. Like and subscribe on YouTube to see all the action, or you can head over to Spotify and Apple if you want to listen to it again. And while you're on YouTube, check out Vintage Weights PGH and subscribe for all of those weight restoration and history videos. With me tonight is Kurt, otherwise known as the Kurt Locker, on Instagram and YouTube. How are you, Kurt? I'm doing great, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Now, before we proceed, we should let you know the next two episodes are going to be focused on strongman. Because if you know anything about physical culture and the history of strength sports, strongman has played a part for quite a long time. And Kurt is no stranger to the strongman sport. Whether you lift strongman or not, this will relate to your home gym, and that's why Kurt is here, to help relate it to your home gym experience. So please drop a comment and let us know, do you have any experience in Strongman? And speaking of that, what's your experience in Strongman, Kurt? Can you tell us a little bit of your background with it? Yeah, absolutely. So as a kid, I grew up enjoying watching World's Strongest Man, you know, Christmas special type of thought. Uh episodes and then i went a really long time where i just was in high school i didn't do the traditional like garage gym experience which it always seems to be like lifted in high school i actually went a really long time joined the military uh and didn't get into strongman until about 2014 or so and i didn't compete until 2016 and uh been competing ever okay. since 2016 and Plenty of shows underneath my belt, a uh, ton of fun to do. I have a couple people that I've coached and just a sport that I can't get enough of. I might be hitting you up soon then because I took up some strongman lifts about two years ago myself and I've become growingly obsessed with it. And it's about time that for better or worse, I hop into a competition and I could probably use a coach to uh, get to that point. But regardless of my own personal journey with Strongman, whether I pursue it or not, I appreciate the history of it because when it comes to Strongman, you've got Olympic weightlifting, which is now two lifts, essentially, powerlifting with three lifts. They both use a barbell exclusively. Now, Strongman, how many lifts? How many implements? What are we dealing with, Kurt? Well, so in a traditional strongman show, or I say traditional, it's not the right word, but in a typical strongman competition, you'll have five events. Uh, it'll be a combination of static strength events as well as uh, some dynamic events. What that means is you're going to have some where it's like a deadlift, where you're just picking up a large load, and that's it. And then you'll have some, the dynamic strength events, which are like your farmer's carry, your yoke, your stone loading events, and your medleys. Okay. So a lot more variety, it's safe to say. So a lot more oh. variety, it's safe to say. Absolutely. And when it comes to some of the uh, the hosts of these strongman competitions, the event organizers, uh, so like Chris Vaccio comes to mind. Chris Vaccio, who organizes a lot of shows here in Ohio, he'll actually go and find completely random stuff. So like I showed up to a competition <laughs> and Vaccio had found a fire hydrant that he decided that we were all going to press <laughs> over. Nice. Well, that's the perfect segue into the history of Strongman because Dr. Terry Todd, who is a world record power lifter and helped create the Arnold, helped found the Stark Center in Texas, he said in a Rogue Legends documentary that lifting odd but familiar objects gave the crowd an immediate frame of reference for classic Strongman. They gave them a an idea of how heavy this thing was because when we're talking about you know the turn of the century the late 1800s early 1900s not that many people had home gyms at the time not many people could just look and see a set of weights and think oh okay that's uh, 300 pounds that's heavy so they had to awe them they had to show them something familiar so for example let me show you a picture of the famous Eugene Sandow here's Sandow lifting a horse this is not a photograph, if you're listening. It's a print. But in any case, this was a true thing he did. And what he would do is there was a frame on the side of the stage because this is theater and circus performing type classic strongman. And Sandow would perform typically in a theater in his prime. And it would help him to get the horse in position overhead. 
and he's standing there. He's bracing on his left side, but he's got his arm fully extended overhead, holding the harness of the horse near the base of the horse's neck, and the horse is suspended up over his back. And what he would do is then walk out into the view of the crowd holding this horse, and he would walk about the stage. Now, Kurt, I highly doubt that anyone in your competitions have lifted horses, but you named a fire hydrant. Any other familiar objects that someone in the crowd might recognize or say, oh, okay, that's a heavy object? Oh, absolutely. Like safes. Uh, when you see a safe, that's a heavy object. I'm trying to think of some other right off the top of my head. And uh, I've never seen a horse yet. Yeah. But uh, I think that like a natural stone is a really good example. So if you're walking along a river and you see a natural stone, they're just heavy. You walk on them. You kind of feel how they rock back and forth. And then you see some people pick them up. Absolutely. I'll get more into that in part two. So make sure you subscribe and you follow to, so that you'll miss out on part two. That when I go hiking... I almost always pick up a stone. Like my kids know to expect it at this point. They even see a large stone and ask like, dad, can you pick that up? So that's part of my personal strongman experience, but getting into the history of one of the most famous pieces of strongman, it would be this. Have you ever seen this before? So for the viewers on YouTube, I'll drop a picture here, but the first implement we're really going to dig into would be a piece of a train, and specifically two train wheels with a thick bar running between them. Just in your mind's eye there, Kurt, are you experienced enough to try to figure out what I'm describing? Absolutely. I'm pretty sure you're describing Apollon's axle. That's correct. So, Louis Uni, known as Apollon, that was his stage name. He was from France, and he was ridiculously strong. He I mean, he put feats of strength into a new stratosphere with what he was able to do, but he wasn't quite a showman. He was the opposite, if you will, of Eugene Sandow, who I had showed hoisting a horse and, you know, wowing the crowd walking across. So where did he get this axle? Where did he get these wheels? Well, he was feeling the pressure. People are telling him, hey, you need to like put on a bit of spectacle. Plus, strong man, they're scraping together what they can find. So he goes to a junkyard and he's looking around to try to find things, kind of like the, you know, found fire hydrant that you mentioned in modern times. And he finds this narrow gauge axle and wheels that actually weigh 366 ish pounds. Now, what do you think made it hard to lift that uh, other than just the sheer weight of it? Well, there's going to be a few things. Uh, one, the actual diameter of the shaft that you're going to grab onto. And the shaft on that, that original Apollon's axle, is actually wider than what we even really consider to be a standard axle today. Uh, outside of that, you also have the, uh, the just lack of any sort of whip or flex to the bar at all. So when you pull that weight... Uh, for instance, I'll use a foobar, which is a modern take on an axle or an axle, to train speed off the floor. Um, because there's no bend to the bar at all, you pull all okay. that weight up, weight up simultaneously off the ground. Uh, outside of that, okay. it's going to be the lack of markings. So how do you center yourself on the bar? Um, and additionally, so it's interesting you brought up that it's a narrow gauge uh, because mm -hmm. uh, that was over in Europe. And if we're going back, we're looking at history itself, pre-World War One. And uh, we're looking at those narrow gauge railways. Uh, mm -hmm. They were so narrow that some of the, if you were to take like a modern strongman, a 400 pound guy, and try to put sure. him on some of those narrow gauge, he might actually fill that space up and not be able to <laughs> really squeeze in there. Yeah. And then there's a lot of other history there too, because uh, sure. if you're thinking about World War I, the narrow gauge and normal gauges had a lot of mm -hmm. issues, which created mobilization problems. And it, that's all just other history that I'm obsessed with. Hey. If someone's listening to home gym history, they're learning to appreciate history. So that's fine. We could throw in a little military history. But, you know, it's interesting, the point you bring up, that when we look at, especially the heavyweights, I mean, there are, you know, and we can get into different categories of strongman, but, I mean, you're, no offense, a fairly, you know, average-looking guy, Kurt. You're not, you know, you don't strike me as a Brian Shaw, you know. No. I don't. I don't think you're, you know, taking twenty thousand calories a day in or anything crazy like I see on the YouTube videos for these world's strongest man heavyweights. But it makes me wonder. Okay, if they walked up to that thing, what would happen? Well, that leads into where we go from there. And just a couple little details about it too is that the wheels didn't revolve, so that's nope. tricky in itself. 
and just the smoothness. There's no texture, no knurling or anything. It was a smooth bar. So he lifted it, Apollon, at all of his shows. From that point on, it became kind of his you know, calling card. But the tricky thing is there's no evidence that he cleaned and pressed it. It's said legendarily that he did, but it proved to be so difficult to clean and press over the years. There were only three people to clean and press it up until modern times or more recent times, I guess I should say. So Charles Rigolo, he cleaned and pressed it in France in 1930. And apologies if I'm mispronouncing that name. And then I'll drop a picture of John Davis. And this particular picture has been uh, enhanced. It's been colored, you know, even though it was an original black and white. So it's a striking image. And it's him in 1949 in Paris, France, cleaning and pressing it. And John Davis specifically, they were there for the World Weightlifting Championships in France. And then they specifically sought out Apollon's uh, Axel to see if someone could do it. And John Davis pulled it off. Fast forward a couple more years and the legendary Norb Shemansky of York Barbell and of Olympic weightlifting fame, he cleaned and jerked the Axel three times. So he really upped the game by cleaning and jerking it three times. And that was also in France. He specifically sought it out, wanted to put on a display with it. So then for years, decades, no one's able to do this. So, 1994 comes around, Iron Mind. They create Apollon's Axle, and they start producing Apollon's Axle um, replicas. But there's no wheel involved. It's just the Axle bar. And some credit goes to them in terms of popularizing that in strongman events and things of that nature. Um, if I want to get an Axle, you know, what's, what's some good Axles? You mentioned the Foo Bar. Where else can I see an Axle? So there's all sorts of different Axles that you can get. And uh, it, it's actually kind of wild because uh, there's there's one there's a little bit of an argument when you actually considered what a modern axle was because there's a, a debate right now between some strong man it's not that big of a debate but is a <laughs> 1.9 inch outside diameter pipe which is a one and a half inch schedule 80 piece of steel is that mm -hmm. an axle and there's some people that will say no even though that's pretty regularly accessible it's easy to access rather. And uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, and then there's other people that will say that a two inch outside diameter is the kind of the minimum. Now, what I have here um, behind me, actually the top bar right there. Okay. For those of you watching, it's just a, an axle barbell on the wall. That's actually a piece of two inch outside diameter DOM steel, which is the same steel they use when they make NASCAR frames. Uh, oh, wow. I, I built that one myself. Um, I did have to shave down the outside to accommodate my plates. Mm -hmm. uh, so for most people, I would say that going to, uh, so if you want high end, uh, going mm -hmm. to someone like Mike Bartos Power Center, going to someone like Doug Madewell over at Madewell Strength, uh, yeah. they're going to have like solid options as well as hollow tube options. Uh, you can also get them from Rogue Fitness. I believe mm -hmm. Rep Fitness has them now. Uh, Titan Fitness has them. Uh, they're pretty I big, didn't take accessible. my Titan off the wall. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry to jump in there, but, yeah, I'm looking at my Titan, and it is so scratched up and horrible looking that I just didn't even bother to take it off the wall and put it behind me. It's powder coated through the end, which is one of my biggest pet peeves in a home gym because immediately yep. everything gets scraped off, and there's a little black, you know, probably toxic powder coating flakings everywhere <laughs> that my children are picking up. What's this, Dad? So I, I'm not a fan of the powder coating on the sleeves, but I've yep. been looking to upgrade, and I'll take some of those suggestions to heart. In terms of functionality at the time, you know, uh, it, it, the price was right, which is what I think, you know, led me to a lot of my purchases early on. So, you know, it functions well, but I want to upgrade and get something a little nicer. As far yeah. as upgrading from 1994 in the Iron Mind, in 2002, here's an upgrade. Avanco, they make a replica mm. of the entire axle. So I'll drop a picture of that. It is, wow. I, I mean, it's shining like the Ivanko chromes you could imagine. And it's got the actual wheels on it. They've even got some change plates in the set. The picture shows a crate with the bar and the wheels. And the reason why it goes back to Dr. Terry Todd, because this was being planned for the first Arnold Classic. And the first event of it was going to be this lift. Mark Henry. So. 
Mark Henry, very good. So that's yes. what I was going to ask. Do you know who lifted it? Because two I, men were able to, and Mark Henry was one of them. Yeah, and he double overhanded that thing. He, You're darn he right did, he did. He did not continental <laughs> clean that. He double overhanded he it. But Mark Henry is just an absolute uh, specimen of an athlete as oh. well. Like Just so much respect to that man. He competed as an Olympic weightlifter. Uh, mm-hmm. Wasn't he a, a pro wrestler? But like He sure was. He yep, went by and, World's Strongest Man, Mark Henry, exactly. in the WWE. Yep. So the story goes that he would know. Dr. Terry Todd was like his mentor. I mean, Mark Henry's from Texas. The Todds, Jan Todd and Terry Todd live there. And if you watch the Rogue documentary, The Commissioner, I've mentioned before, Mark Henry's on there and talks about the mentorship of Terry Todd and coaching. And Dr. Todd went to him and said, look, I'm having this strongman competition. You're the world's strongest man in WWE. Why don't you come do it? Well, then Mark Henry later in an interview said that he was approached by, you know, the powers that be at WWE that said, you better win this thing because we're not marketing the world's second strongest man. Yeah. So he said, I took this thing seriously because that was my bread and butter. Like that was my job. And I was essentially being told like, you're going to lose your job if you don't win this thing. So he had several replicas built and fabricated for himself to train with started out with one in the two hundreds and then wanted to add weight onto it. And the person he was having fabricate them actually made a whole separate bar, separate axle with wheels. And then another one all the way up to 400 pounds. And I have no idea what happened to these things, but it'd be pretty cool to see them all in a line. So he knew in the back of his mind that I can clean and press 400 pounds. This thing in front of me is, you know, 366 pounds. I think technically 365.9. And so He went to that thing like, I mean, (laughs) a complete animal. I mean, he was so ferocious. And I'll drop a link to the video of it on Home Gym History's Instagram. I do follow-up posts because you've got to see it. There's a folding chair. Keep your eye on the folding chair because he comes up. He hits that thing once. The crowd's cheering. Boom, he hits it again, puts it up a second time. And then he put it up a third time. And keep in mind, he was late in the event. So up until him, nobody had put it overhead. And I think only two competitors had even cleaned it. And then up comes Mark Henry to do it three times. And then he grabs the folding chair after the third time as if he's going to like whip it into the audience, but then kind of jokingly puts it down, you know, a little, little WWE kind of humor in the moment. So yeah, just a with authority historic lift from Mark Henry. And, you know, I don't want to leave him out. Mark Philippi, world's strongest man competitor, after Mark Henry's lift, he managed to also clean and jerk it. So he goes into history books. And one last thing about the whole, you know, event is that Mark Henry, in addition to knowing he was going to win this thing, that he could lift even more weight, he wanted to do it specifically three times to honor the three men that came before him which I thought was pretty cool that he wanted to do it three times because he wanted a lift for every person that had lifted it before him. That's a home gym history type of thing in my book. So absolutely any other axle bar kind of, um, you know, advancements or any kind of axle bar home gym advice. Like how do you incorporate the axle? Let's say I'm a guy who I've been lifting a while. I have some equipment, but I don't do any strong man. I just really like the sound of your voice, so I tuned into this episode. Tell me, why should I go out and get an axle? What am I going to do with this thing? Well, with the sultry sound of my voice, uh, what I'll say (laughs) is, uh, so I kind of alluded to it earlier, the axle is an absolutely amazing tool, especially for training speed off of the floor. So if you want to follow somebody that will commonly post about speed off the floor, Mike Bartos over at Mike Bartos Power Center uh, will post quite a bit about those uh, type of things. So he trains speed off the floor, and he'll either use a FUBAR, which is just Mm -hmm. a slightly narrower version of an axle bar, non-rotating sleeves, inch and a half diameter shaft. And what that allows you to do is instead of even with a powerlifting bar where you're going to have the middle portion that kind of bends up as you increase in load, even at small amount of weight, 315 pounds, Mm -hmm. uh, it'll start to bend. Uh, With an axle bar, all the weight will come up at the same time, usually. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, it means the axle (laughs) is about to break. Yeah, uh, that's my Titan that. over there. No offense, yeah, Titan. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, I'm not well, lifting that much. Mine's good for a while. Um, what it also can be used for is training grip. So uh, developments. Uh, so if you do any sort of, I'm going to mess up what this is called, but the uh, the grip competitions. 
It's not strength lifting, is it? Oh, arm lifting. Arm lifting. Uh, there's you. arm lifting and grip strength. Yeah, I've been I've been in that world for a little bit. So those guys also will do a double overhand axle in a really. Uh, again, an absolute animal and an absolute athlete, Ode Haugen, uh, with his oh, yeah. double overhand axle work, uh, his Saxon bar work too, but that's a different piece. But his double overhand work is absolutely phenomenal when it comes to the axle. There's also some strongman competitions where it will be a DOH axle or a double mm-hmm. overhand axle, no straps, and it'll be for like max reps or max weight. Okay. And what that's going to really do is it's going to open up. So I, I did a post once. It's on my website. And I was talking mm-hmm. about different sort of grip strength and uh, ways to train grip strength. And you have closed and open hand. I'm overgeneralizing it. But with closed yeah. hand, as you close down on a barbell, uh, you're getting more of that closed hand. So you're resisting the opening. But because it's retracted okay. so much, uh, it's just a little bit easier. Uh, when you have open hand grip strength, you're having mm-hmm. to maintain that without as much purchase, I'll, I'll say, okay. on the bar. And uh, so it helps you with uh, grip strength work, which is why they use it in arm lifting. Uh, well, it sounds so some a lot. Other... The open hand that you're mentioning, and even for those of you listening, he's making the motions with his hands. You know, the fingers aren't touching the palms with open hand. The fingers are still two, three inches from the thumb, if you will. And that reminds me right away of like Arthur Saxon and a Saxon bar where yep. you've got this, I believe it's three inch and four inch uh, rectangular bar. And speaking of odd, I've seen him. I mean, he's in his 70s and he does enormous lifts on a Saxon where, you know, he, he's putting up things that like, I'm deadlifting with like my deadlift bar, but yeah. he's gripping it, you know, as if it's like a, I don't know. It's like, it looks like a wooden beam. It's like three inches by four inches rectangular that this man is lifting. So he is very interesting. I would love to have him on the show and kind of go through yeah. his history and his relationship with Martin Lisi's, for example. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, he'd be a really cool one to talk to. So Absolutely. with um, lifting overhead and, you know, we left off with Mark Henry putting up the, Oplone's Axel. We're going to go into another famous strongman overhead lift and probably one of my top five favorite things in my home gym. With Not, not a lot of people might predict that. If they follow me, they, they see all this old stuff. It's actually my strongman log. I love lifting my strongman log. And it's another purchase I'd really like to upgrade, so we'll get into that. But you're no stranger to the strongman log, Kurt. And anyone who follows you on Instagram or YouTube has probably seen some of your DIY efforts with it. So could you give a short kind of recap on your experiences there? Absolutely. So uh, my first log that I ever lifted was, I'm pretty sure it was a pit bull log. I've gone back and looked at the video, but it was my first competition I'd ever done. I'd never touched a log before in my life. And you can tell when you watch the video. Uh, but it was on a medley, so it was an axle. I think it was a 220 axle. Uh, then it was a 495 deadlift. And it was the first time I pulled 495, and then a 220 log. And when I got to that log, I picked it up, never touched it before, and almost died. Got it overhead still, <laughs> but I almost died. Yeah. But a log is a really awesome piece of equipment. Generally speaking, you have two types. You're going to have a steel mm-hmm. log and a wooden log. Uh, if you ask me and you ask people like Steve Slater and I'm going to – Richard Looney uh, over yeah, at Monster's sure. Gym, mm-hmm. uh, the wood logs just – they look cooler, I think. Yeah. Uh, and they're also – they feel they different when you press them because there's a lot of mass inside mm-hmm. of that log. It's a lot harder to get that that okay. kind of center load. And uh, if we're call, if we're hailing back to like 1990 Strongman, sure. I mean, the logs that they were using were just – pegs driven through actual logs with bark still on them yeah Um, and it definitely wasn't centered like it wasn't even on both sides (laughs) yeah now for my my diy ones i uh i generally will make a 12 inch minimum outside diameter log i keep looking past my camera right now i have my my first one which is about 12 and a half inches okay uh generally speaking throughout and that changes a little bit throughout the seasons it'll shrink Mm -hmm. um oh that's interesting it'll shrink yeah, during the dry spell. So, like right okay. now, because I have wooden handles on my wooden my metal logs. log, it's the same. <laughs> yeah, it just stays the same. <laughs> there, every once in a while, a spider it, makes it in there because it's hollow. You know, that's a scary thing. But uh, no, it's nothing's changing. Yep. And then uh, the new one is uh, twelve. It's pretty close to twelve all throughout. And I, I'm making that okay. for somebody in particular. Now, my steel log uh, is a twelve inch. 
which is generally that's going to be a uh, a male size log. That's what uh, I was just going to ask. I see yep. like eight inch, ten inch, twelve inch. But as I said at the top of the show, I've never competed. I'm just messing around in my home gym. What's what's typical? So for males, twelve inch, and then for yes. strong women, we've got what a ten inch, so, eight inch. So for uh, the women's classes and probably the the teen classes, oh, uh, you'll have a ten inch. Um, okay. Additionally, th that can change as well, though. So, for instance, uh, Slater log, which is mm -hmm. used pretty commonly. Now, the, the, the Slater logs at World's Strongest Man are 12 inches outside diameter. Okay. However, a lot of the ones that you find at local competitions are mm -hmm. actually 10 inch outside diameter. Okay. Um, and, they, and they feel different. And those are things that, uh, generally speaking, you'll want to know if you are actually competitive in Strongman. You'll want to know that before you get in because you want to train on what you're going to use. Um, now, now, before we lose any ones, listeners... If you've been completely confused, sorry to cut in here, could you just, for the listeners that are like, what is this guy talking about? Like, there's a log, yeah. like, what goes on here? He's talking about wooden log. This guy has a metal log with a spider in it. So just briefly, you know, for a listener, someone not watching on YouTube, what are you doing? You're picking this thing up with a neutral grip, and then yep. what happens from the floor to get it up over your head that's different than if I'm grabbing an axe or grabbing an Olympic weight, uh, Olympic weightlifting bar or something like that. Absolutely. So uh, it's going to do a couple things. So one, so how do you, how do we clean this and how do we press it? Sure. Uh, you're going to pick it up usually off of tires, off of pads, sometimes just off the floor. You're going to pick it up to your lap and you're going to kind of kneel down uh, in the squat position and you're going to pull it up into your chest uh, with the handle slightly facing away from you. But that's going to vary depending on the size of the log. More on that later. Yeah. Um, now, as you stand up, you want to keep it hugged into your chest, and you actually want to roll it up your chest as you stand and as you shoot your hips forward. That's okay. going to be the front rack position. Uh, at that point, you're, you've cleaned the log. Mm -hmm. Now, some things with the log that are different than an axle bar or a barbell. Uh, when you're standing with an axle bar and a barbell, and for those that are listening, I'm pretending that I'm holding a bar in the front rack, you can stand and your head can be in a neutral position where you can breathe freely, yeah. <laughs> where you can see ahead of you. Uh, you can see what's happening. You mm -hmm. can look left and you can look right, and there's you know a clear field of view. Now, with a log, because it's either 10, 8, 10, or 12 inches in diameter, uh, think about that and how you're trying to get that over your midfoot. So when mm -hmm. you're standing in the front rack, you want the weight to be over your midfoot, and so you're going to have to end up looking straight up into the sky, and that's going to allow you to get the bar back. Now, at that point... In Strongman, you can jerk it, you can push press it, but you're going to press it overhead, and that would be a lift uh, once you get the down command. Yeah, I the first Strongman I saw, you know, cleaning and jerking it would be um, World's Strongest Gay, Rob. He, yep. uh, he does like an Olympic jerk to get it overhead, and he's, I mean, it's funny to call him small because the dude is like, whatever, 300 some pounds, but he's one of the smaller worldest world's strongest man competitors and yet he's a renowned strongman log lifter oh he's he's a fabulous presser at, uh, yeah yep that's his bread and butter at the competitions and i i would assume that it has to do not just with strength but also just his technique the things you're describing i mean he's really mastered but getting back to the history of it you kind of do dove into it a little bit i love it Kurt. You, you you've got it on point so it's not just a nickname i mean and it's not just made out of wood these were actual logs i'll drop a picture of bill kazmaier one of the kaz one of the best world's strongest men competitors in history and my favorite i mean all time one of my favorites so in the first world's strongest man event using the log in 1980 it was as a max lift and in this picture of kaz he's holding you know like you described kurt you described it perfectly it's just like a lumberjack cut down a tree and then put a couple holes in it. And who knows if those holes are centered or what. And he's got that typical Kaz face, you know, he's like scrunching his face, his lips coming out. Like anyone who's seen him, I mean, it brings me back nostalgia to childhood because he was the guy whenever yep. I was watching those like, you know, marathon world's strongest man one after another on a Saturday morning. So he won the next two years as well with max lifts. He set new world records in the strongman log every single year. So like he was the presser of the original strongman log. And then the current world record, I'll drop a picture of this, goes to Big Z. Do you know who mm. I'm referring to when I say Big Z? Oh, it's a journalist of Viscous, who's yes, now an sir. actor. 
<laughs> yeah, did you see the... Uh... <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know at home, Big Z, Zadrina Saviscus, is one of the most decorated strongmen in history. He's won every strongman competition you can think of numerous times. I mean... And powerlifting. Big... Powerlifting as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, is it Lithuania or Latvia? He's uh, Lithu- Lithuania. Oh, gosh, now you got me thinking. Yeah, I know. Now Lithuania. I'm getting confused. He was but, actually a mayor. He was like an elected yes, leader. That's what I was going to say. He was an elected leader. The state government like let him work out under the uh, stadium, like you yeah. know, and, like all kinds of interesting stuff with him. He has a chain of businesses and things. He's like their national hero. And Big Z set the world record, the current world record, with a four hundred and sixty-eight and a half pound overhead press of the log clean and press of the log which i can't even imagine nowadays the event in world strongest man with the log is uh, for reps not for max lift so that press took place elsewhere with big z so kind of like i asked with the axle what place does a strongman log you know i i said it's my favorite but it might not be someone else's favorite if they don't know what they're getting into if you're going to drop a little money or if you're going to go buy an axe and carve one up like you have how are you using this in the home gym? How are you going to incorporate it if you're not going whole hog into, you know, strongman? But this just looks kind of like a fun toy. Like I saw Basement Brandon lifting one. Yep. What are you going to do? Well, so if you're Basement Brandon, you buy Mike Bartos Power Center, <laughs> uh, nice. which is funny because he actually took my recommendation. We were talking about logs to purchase. So I, mm-hmm. I had to pat myself on the back that I influenced <laughs> Brandon on something. He's always been such a great help for me. It was Thank nice you. to help him. Okay, so here is... Uh, where I'm kind of torn. So it's funny when you talk to Steve Slater. So I don't live too far away from Steve. Uh, mm-hmm. Steve Slater is the one who taught me how to tape up for stone. So I've no way. I have St- yeah. So I have Steve Slater's number. We periodically talk. That's we, awesome. When I was making the logs, I was calling him on my first one because I've made three. Uh, the hardware point. store is on my list of like summer vacations. <laughs> yes. Which my wife was like, wait, you want to go to a hardware store? So fill in the oh. listeners. What am I talking about? You're talking about Slater's Hardware, which is more than a hardware store. Okay, mm-hmm. let me just let me just start out. So, like, you don't understand. <laughs> when you show up, I'm pretty sure it's Lancaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you Lancaster, Ohio, you show up. I actually competed down the street from there. Uh, you walk in the front. It looks like just some small-town hardware store, but it's not. Because <laughs> you get inside, and uh, immediately you see that he has, like, home brewing stuff uh he's got a whole room like you know the old school hardware rooms where it's like mm-hmm. you go up and it's just like bins everywhere of just oh, different sure. hardware yeah. um, so like you go in and you're like oh what a resourceful place like oh every <laughs> cookie cutter every single cookie cutter ever made they have it <laughs> nice. uh, and so you get to the back of the store and you're like oh what's that piece of wood sitting over there uh, and as you walk to the back of the store, you're, you stumble over, you know, a 560-pound stone, which I wonder nice. which stone that is. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's the stone that Brian Shaw loaded. Awesome. And you go a little bit further, uh, and that big piece of wood that you saw in the back is the Austrian oak oh, from man. the Arnold Strongman Classic. And it's That's just amazing. there. Then you look over to the right, and you see, like, a power rack with some Ivanko plates. Uh-huh. You turn around, and you realize that <laughs> the old Ivanko Hummer tire deadlift. No. And you're like, am I at the warehouse where they yeah. store everything for the Arnold? And <laughs> in a way, you kind of are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he's got his hand in so many different things, strongman-related. It's fascinating. And on part two of this, tune in, because we'll get into Atlas Stones and... Steve mm. Slater will come right back around because he played a huge part in that. So getting back in, I, I took you on a whole different sidetrack of the hardware yeah. store. <laughs> so back into all of this with the log, what place does it have in the home gym? You know, what if I have, I'm not really sold on Strongman, but this looks kind of fun. How am I incorporating it? What am I doing? How am I using it? So it, it, it would be a pretty big initial investment. So I would I would posit that most individuals that would purchase a log are are not going to be your general strength and conditioning. However, um, as much as I like to, I'm a habitual shit talker, uh, (laughs) and I talk a lot of smack about CrossFit. However, 
Uh, CrossFit is an awesome place where mm -hmm. you can use a log. And part of what made the Slater logs, because Steve doesn't actually make his logs, for instance, anymore. Mm -hmm. His son makes them. Nice. Um, and his son has this really good method for doing them. They're pretty uniform because that was some of the complaints that they got from the CrossFit community is that some of the logs were a little bit irregular, something that's uh, desired in strong okay. but not desired in CrossFit. Gotcha. So using for metabolic conditioning, working on mm -hmm. overhead type movements. Uh, additionally, what's nice is because you're using a neutral grip, mm -hmm. you can use it for things like bench press. And it's kind of like a like a board neutral grip bench press. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see Brian Allsrue. Um, so I used to do Brian Allsrue's programs. Mm -hmm. Um, also awesome guy to meet and, uh, yeah, never say he presses with them. Yeah. Never say athletics. Brian's an awesome person, but yeah, he presses with it out of the rack a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. but I mean, we have one at work and That's I, cool. back when I used, I used to run a schoolhouse and I used to occasionally bring my steel log cause it's nice mm -hmm. and light at 85 pounds. And it works the military. If, Listeners don't yes. know your background. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was doing the schoolhouse thing from 18 to 21, and I'd bring my log in occasionally, and uh, we would do log burpees. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. just fun because it's, it's a big piece, and there's a lot of cool stuff with Strongman, with logs too, mm -hmm. but if you go back and you actually like bring this full circle back to like a normal person in the gym, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we think back to like the biggest loser, yeah, um, a lot of strongman movements actually are really good oh, yeah. uh, for a couple things. One, uh, irregular movements are incredibly important. For instance, uh, in the National Academy of Sports Medicine (NASM). Okay. So, if you uh, purchase a textbook to get your certified strength and conditioning specialist certification, mm -hmm. uh, one of the lifts that they talk about is the log, and that's because it forces you to actually deal with forces that are abnormal, yeah. which is really great for general strength and conditioning. It's not very common, but it is very great for it. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, in things like The Biggest Loser, doing things like log is really fun because it's not normal. It doesn't feel all the time like it's a gym. Um, if it's a wooden log, even if you're just out in the woods and you pick up a stick and press it overhead, there's something that's kind of fun about yeah. it. There's something that's just kind of in your nature like, I want to pick up that log. I, I couldn't agree thing. more. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's why I liked it so much. I, I, I guess I'm that weirdo that went <laughs> to the log first. It was the first strongman thing I bought. But it, it just was so different from everything else I was doing. I had dumbbells, barbell, you know. I, it was so different that I enjoyed it, and I did all kinds of stuff with it. I would do, and I still do, rows and, you know, like you said, bench press, a, a weird kind of board press i've done incline press with it so i mean another thing that just feels that it fills the kind of uh, primitive nature of things for me would be the circus dumbbell yes picking up a circus dumbbell and for me i collect york roundheads and globe dumbbells so i have some larger dumbbells and they go up to 100 pounds but Circus dumbbells go well beyond 100 pounds, but for me, when I'm in my home gym and I love taking them outside and doing it, there's just something about grabbing that dumbbell from the ground and then getting it up onto my shoulder and then doing kind of a push press motion to get it up overhead. Do you know anything about famous uh, dumbbells of history? We mentioned one in our dumbbell episode a like couple episodes Sears? ago. There you like, go, Louis like Sears. Louis C. That's yeah, right. Well, so Louis the C. reason that that's so popular is because the Sears mm -hmm. style dumbbell, uh, which I might have seen at Slater's Hardware sitting on the floor. <laughs> nice, nice. They they're they're just so because like you see them in person, mm -hmm. um, and you're like, there's no way that that weighs that much because it, it'll yeah. say like three hundred. You're like. <laughs> Bowl. like there's yeah, no way out of here and then you walk up and you try to pick that thing up and you're like holy crap yeah, like, yeah. this is real but those seer style dumbbells are so mm -hmm. cool and they're so unique and uh in a way so i did a competition where it was a loadable globe style dumbbell mm -hmm. it looked exactly like a seared dumbbell it's available from arsenal strength there you um, go. i need to get one honestly because i i actually really liked pressing it it was a steel mm -hmm. shot loadable and it was affordable and they're they're different because when you have a a tube style. So like if you were to imagine a log and you cut it down into two, uh, two circles and put a handle mm -hmm. in the middle, 
those, you can kind of brace those on your wrist. And so when you press them, you have a point of contact where you're gripping, and you also have a point of contact on your wrist so that when you okay. press it, you're pushing with two points. With those sear styles, you don't. It's just floating out in space. And a, a really good example of something that I, I purchased recently was the Bartos Big Top Circus Dumbbell. There you go. Which is a, a representation of a more traditional style sear dumbbell. Beautiful as pieces. soon as I saw you post that, it went on my want list. I'm hoping Santa <laughs> Claus will bring that for me this year. Uh, I've been even dropping hints with like my children, like, you know what dad wants for Christmas? Uh, so we'll big see top. if that yeah. pans out, the big top. So you're Why a big... You think- uh, so, well, Ryan, real quick. So, like, you're yeah. a big Bill Kazmaier fan, just a small size. Sure. Player. I'm sorry to everybody that's sick of these. No, no, um, go for it. My coach down in Texas, Mike Bartos, awesome, strong man. He is the first person I ever saw that actually personally owned a Big Top Circus dumbbell, and it's signed by Bill Kazmaier. Nice. So that's pretty kind awesome. Of a fun thing. Well, I, I mean, do you know why it's the Circus Dumbbell or why it's shaped the way it is or why – any of this occurred in history? So uh, on this, uh, and it's okay to say I, I no. Gar- <laughs> I, I guarantee you I've heard it, but I just yeah. can't think of it. No, I'm going to say no. I don't know this one. Okay. Well, we're wrapping up this episode. This, so this is a quick one. And if you're still listening, man, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate the listeners. Our uh, views and our listens have been going up. And I think it's because people are telling other people about it. So please continue to do that. And please drop a comment and let us know if any of this resonated. Are you going to go out there and get yourself an axle, a strongman log? Are you going to go out there and get a circus dumbbell? And the history of the circus dumbbell is the circus circus that, as I mentioned with Eugene Sandow and some of these other classic strongmen, these classic strongmen of the late 1800s and early 1900s, they weren't in World's Strongest Man competitions. Those didn't come around until the 1970s. They were performing in a vaudeville circus theater environment where they needed to wow the crowd. So we're going to bring this full circle from the very start where the Dr. Terry Todd quote that I read mentioned giving some kind of frame of reference. And even though it wasn't familiar to see a globe style dumbbell, it hit the audience like a shockwave seeing the size of it, that this was nothing they'd seen, you know, the, some fitness, some dumbbells and things had started to become part of popular culture. But when they saw a strong man step out there with, you know, this dumbbell that had spheres on either end the size of basketballs and then hoisted over his head, or in the case of the great Sandwina, hoisted over her head. I mean, it it, it was a crowd pleaser. People went nuts. And Louis Sear, he tapped into that. He It became his performance. He had several of these dumbbells. And in the 1880s, he began touring. He began touring with them. He was from Canada, and there's a great museum that's also, in addition to Slater's Hardware, on my vacation, uh, you know, dream list in Montreal, the Sear Museum, where you can see some of his original dumbbells. They weighed between the high hundreds, so we're talking like 180, 190 all the way up through the high 200s, and they could reach well over 270 pounds. So what kind of weights are we dealing with? If, if I go and I, you know, decide, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to join this little, you know, crowd here. I'm going to join a competition, strongman competition. I'm not talking world's strongest man or like this 300 pounder no. you're talking about. What kind of weights am I going to see with one of those loadable ones? Like there's a loadable style circus dumbbell I've seen people selling. What am I looking at? It, so with a, uh... I'm, I'm going to probably be wrong in the low end numbers here, but this okay. is what's really cool. So on the arsenal strength, we'll just talk about that one. That is mm-hmm. eight inch, eight inch or ten inch globes. I think it's eight inch globes, and it goes from eighteen pounds all the way to one hundred twenty five for the small okay. one. You go for the twelve inch one, and I think it starts at forty pounds and goes all the way up to three hundred plus. Uh, you also have manufacturers like Steve Slater, who makes yeah. a shot loadable steel dumbbell. Mm-hmm. Um, and his start off a little bit heavier. They're really well made, though. and they I have seen some that take abuse. Brian Shaw has a few that have been used and abused. I saw uh, on Rogue's website that he co-developed yeah, the that, Monster Bells. Yeah. Well, Steve he, Slater. Well, he, yeah, he made them first. So it's yeah, exactly. really interesting. Rogue basically just licensed his products and hired Steve to be the man when it comes to all the rogue strongman stuff. Exactly. Um, so if you go to if you go to Steve Slater's website, mm-hmm. you can buy all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so little hack for you. Yeah, if yeah. Rogue is out of stock. 
go to Steve Slater's website. Go to the creator. <laughs> that's where it's going to be first. Nice. Um, or at least that's where it used to be first. But yeah. So uh, the, as far as getting into this lift, it is different than just throwing a dumbbell over your head. Um, yes. I briefly mentioned, and for those of you not watching, what I was referencing is that you kind of position it on the back. If, correct me if I'm wrong, please. On the back of your shoulder, if you will, um, sort of behind your ear. Am I anywhere in the right spot there? Am I doing things incorrectly? Yeah. No. So there's. Uh, this is the beauty of strongman. Is there's rarely <laughs> an incorrect. Now uh, I'm I'm completely blanking this guy's name, and I feel very bad about it. But there was one gentleman who was competing in the mid to later 2010s. Mm -hmm. And what he would do is he would actually stand it up on his trap. <laughs> nice. Uh, he would literally stand it up like on his, on his deltoid. That's a and developed trap. Just, and it would be, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he was pressing amazing weight. I've also seen some people where they kind of hold it off to the side for the viewers. If okay. you were to take your arm and hold it to the side so that the globes of the dumbbell are on either side of your shoulder. Okay. I've seen some people press from down there. Oh, uh, personally, I cramp whenever that happens. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, a gentleman named Mark down in Texas, forgetting his last name, uh, he was a skilled strongman, and that's how mm -hmm. he pressed. Huh. Uh, uh, and then what I generally do is I will throw it up. And it'll be between my deltoid and my trap. Okay. And I'll kind of immobilize it there. And then the whole trick, and for the viewers, as you dip, um, mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm, I have my arm up and the, pretend the dumbbell's there. Mm -hmm. And as you come down, you want to keep that elbow up. All right. If you watch yourself in video, as most people fail, it's because as they dip down, mm -hmm. then they start to go up, their elbow will depart okay. and start to come back down. So you keep that elbow up the whole time. No. You're losing the really, force of your body if your elbow yeah, dips. You, it's, it's acting as kind of a, a shock absorber, if you will. Sure. It's a very inefficient thing. And also, it changes the direction of travel of the dumbbell so that it travels out in front of you instead mm -hmm. of overhead. So Nice. Uh, it's definitely, it takes a lot of practice. It's a, it is a skill. Um, for sure. For instance, I, I do train both arms, mm -hmm. but I have never pressed my Bartos dumbbell, <laughs> which is 125 pounds empty. <laughs> yeah. I've never pressed it with my left hand because... My left hand just isn't that skilled. See, now you're talking like a grip strength athlete. <laughs> so I, uh, and no offense to my gripsters, I'm trying my hardest to get my weak hand to be a little stronger. Yeah, I, tough. I would suggest anyone try it with a solid dumbbell. Be careful. Yeah. I, I am humble enough to admit that I got a little ambitious one morning lifting in my lifting in my home gym and i had a adjustable dumbbell olympic adjustable dumbbell with you know collars on it and i was thinking, oh man all right like i can do 50 i can do 60 and i'm just throwing the weights on there and next thing you know you know i push that sucker up there and i have like 10 pounders falling back down on me so <laughs> please use a solid dumbbell of some sort or have really good collars on there if you're going so really, to try. another really great set of tools. So there's two other tools that I'll usually really recommend to people. Okay. Uh, one, I'll start with the controversial one first. And uh, if you have watched my channel or watched my Instagram, I am obsessed with the Havoc Triads or yeah. the Q-Bells. If you follow the, uh, the Kabuki style ones, which mm -hmm. are the same design, same person. Now, Graham, when you made those, uh, he made them so that you can reach through and grab a hold of the upper handle. And when I'm okay. warming up for Circus Dumbbell, oh. that is actually what I use because nice. it sits fairly consistently the same. It feels about the same as mm -hmm. a Circus Dumbbell, um, but it's pretty safe as far as when you press it. Additionally, you have the, the three-inch grip. Uh, another really great tool if you want to train Circus Dumbbell are center mass bells. So it can either be the center mass bell or the Thompson Fat Bell. Yeah, yeah. Two versions. Oh, we've talked about the Fat Bells. Yep. So yeah, those are great as well because you reach through. And again, your your hand is in the middle of the load. And so as it sits on your shoulder, mm -hmm. um, it's actually sitting on your deltoid. And when you press, it feels very similar. It do, It's not as unstable, but it feels similar. And uh, my coach down in Texas, Mike uh, Badalino, mm -hmm. would always warm up with uh, center mass bells. Oh. I, I don't remember if it's top fat bells or center mass bells, but yeah, yeah. great warm-up tool. That's a great suggestion. Well, Kurt, this is bringing 
Part one of a two-part strongman-focused home gym history to a close. I want to remind everyone to get out there and buy their tickets for Home Gym Con, the first convention of its kind coming in April to French Lick, Indiana. You can save 10% on your ticket by using code VINTAGE. So as a thank you from Vintage Weights PGH and from Garage Gym Experiment to you for listening, please save 10% with code VINTAGE. And that... Definitely applies to you, Kurt. We want to see you there at Home Gym Con. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.